And I think most of us have continued on with our passion out of our own personal rock bottom. So I was easily working 13 hours a day with my eyes closed. Um, and then I'd go to practice. You're working at about three hours a day. I was getting maybe five hours of sleep. I was barely eating enough. I just looked so depleted. And then I eventually ended up training myself into cancer. So I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. <clears throat> and as shocking as it was at the time, after all the deaths settled, I kind of looked at myself and said, yeah, that makes sense. I had beaten my body up. I was so overstressed, so under recovered. It just, it made a lot of sense. <laughs> Hello and welcome. I'm Chris Janke and we have a special podcast today. We're doing a podcast all-star roundtable. This, uh, I think I've only done a couple of these. Where this is basically where I have three guests who have uh, been on my show before and I invited them back to join us and we'll just have kind of a roundtable discussion. So we have Mitchell Yoss. Mitchell, how are you doing today? Excellent. Great to be here with you. Good, good. Uh, Nadia Cashew. Nadia, how's it going? Amazing. Thank you for having me. And then Mia St. Alban, French, Mia St. Alban. <laughs> Sorry, I took one semester of French. I wish I had a last name like Cashew. That's way better. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome last name. Yeah, so well, thank you guys for joining me, all three of you. Uh, I, I enjoyed all three of your episodes um, when I interviewed you. Mia, it's been a little while, a couple months. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Mitchell, it's been just a couple weeks. And then Nadia, your episode just went out. So yes. um, appreciate you guys joining me today. Um, I'd like, uh, we'll go, we'll reverse the order. We'll start with you, Mia. Quick introduction, uh, who you are, kind of how you got into the business and, and who, like, the ideal client that you normally help is? Um, so I am Mia St. Aubain. I am from a good LA, French accent. I live in our nation's capital in Ottawa right now. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a national not-for-profit that is committed to keeping Canadians moving, active, and healthy. We do to we do this through free events, movement sessions, corporate wellness programs, conferences. I have a major, major passion for making health and fitness simple and accessible to all. I was, it's been a part of my life ever since I was a kid and uh, influenced by my mom's Canadian track and field achievements. She was on Team Canada. So I was kind of just like, I was born into it, whether I wanted to be or not, then I ended up loving it. So that works out. Um, I work with large groups of people, so I don't necessarily have one-on-one -on -one clients that I work with, but I work with large groups of people who preferably are still learning about the industry and want to improve their health um, in some shape or form, but they're not experts yet. Got it. And Nadia, uh, who are you and, and what do you do? Yeah, so like you mentioned, Chris, my name is Nadia Cash, who I am the creator of The Cash Method, where we focus on coaching, training, and teaching women on how to really walk in their different kind of strong, right? Ditching the diet mindset, embracing their curves and imperfections, um, and just really rocking their confidence from the, from the inside out, right? Um, and then also to, um, similar to Mia, I, I train the collective. So I work with women in groups to foster and support and create a genuine support system where Yes, I'm leading them, but they're also establishing relationships amongst each other, right? Finding comfort in each other's struggles and re rooting for one another as well. Nice. That's great. And Mitchell, uh, introduction of uh, who you are, what you do. Dr. Mitchell Yas, creator of the Yas Method. It is a diagnostic and treatment model designed to establish the cause of pain and other symptoms. Uh, it basically works by interpreting the body's presentation of symptoms, which is the body's actual mechanism for helping you understand what tissue is in distress, creating symptoms. This was supplanted in the late 1980s, early 1990s by the use of the MRI, which I have theoretical, scientific, and clinical evidence to show that is actually baseless. It actually simply uses something called correlative theory, which is to say, I have pain, I have a herniated disc, therefore the herniated disc is causing the pain, which is actually a baseless mechanism. I can say, I have two elbows at the time I have pain, therefore having two elbows causes pain. <laughs> as sick and perverse as that is, that is the basis that's used. The thing that made me highly unique was I was in medical school. 
I'm taught that I'm supposed to treat certain things found on MRIs. And all of a sudden, as I start treating people, I ask them where their symptoms are. And crazy as it may sound, where they were complaining of their symptoms was not the place they should have been if the structural variation identified were to create pain, which therefore says it can't be the cause of that pain. And through my process of understanding, I established that in more than 98% of cases, the wow. cause of pain is muscular. Wow. That makes sense. That's pretty awesome. And I'm Chris Jenke. I'm a trainer. I do an online now. I started when COVID hit and I really like the online training and my clients seem to like it as well. So I do groups and individual training specializing in no equipment needed, uh, core flexibility and uh, some moderate cardio as well. So this is the type of episode that I love having because the three of us or the three of you plus the four of us have very different backgrounds. And I think what's great about these roundtable discussions from what I've seen in the other ones is that, you know, everybody already knows what we do now. I mean, maybe not the details, but they've got the, the high level introduction. And now I think it's just cool to kind of bounce ideas around. And, you know, we may or may not talk specifically about what we do, but you, you know, more like high level stuff. I really like talking about, you know, why people got into the fitness, you know, Mia, you touched on a little bit with your mom. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So uh, I want to hear your stories about like, what was a moment either right before you started, or maybe you were overweight yourself, like, you know, me personally, in college, I was about 20, 25 pounds overweight. Um, and Mitchell, I can identify with everything you're saying, I had horrible back pain. And, um, and then I will, and then I was underweight. And then I realized that, Hey, you have to eat at least a little bit. So you don't go underweight, but you can't be eating the pizza and getting overweight. And there's kind of a balance, right? So what are, what are your stories for the three of you? Nadia, let's start with you. Like how, how did you get into this? Or maybe it was some time where, you know, you hit sort of like a rock bottom or you had like a, an awakening or in, any stories like that, that's kind of you pushing through a struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome question. So for me, it definitely was a rock bottom at the time, right? So I always had like an athletic background, you know, I played sports growing up, but in my 20s, I just picked up some not the best habits, you know, like you mentioned, Chris, where eating out, partying a lot, drinking way too much and um, starting to have some of that pain. And, you know, I recognize that if I felt like that at that time, now I was 28 years old, I'm like, if I feel like this, what's going to happen in my 30s? What's going to happen in my 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on and so forth, right? So I recognized that I needed to make a change because I wasn't willing to accept what was going to happen if I didn't, you know, make that change. And so that's when I said, I can literally, while everything else may be spinning out of, out of control in my world, I had the physical control to literally put one foot in front of the other and I'll figure it out as I go along, right? Um, and so that's what I did. I made that commitment and I stay committed to my commitment. And I became just a student of the struggle, yielded to the process um, and focused on getting better with one small habit at a time. And then that's just naturally how it evolved for me in, into a business because people notice, right? You don't go from partying until 3 a.m. to waking up at 3 a.m. to go to the gym. Like, how do you do that? How did that mindset shift happen? You see what I'm saying? So that's, that was kind of my aha moment to get started. Nice. Nice. And then uh, Mia, what about you? Uh, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about your mom and her, her, uh, oh, was it the Olympics? Was it team Canada in the Olympics or? Uh, she competed at worlds. Yeah. She came worlds? third at worlds and I used to wear her track suit around the house all the time. Cause she That's was awesome. concerned. <laughs> like old school eighties Canada. It was she, awesome. She took you, um, uh, took you with her to the, to the track meets and stuff and everywhere. Every, yeah. all over Ontario we would uh, follow mom around and watch her compete in races and we joked like we weren't just watching her compete we were watching her win like she would just go and win we'd come home with barbecues and money <laughs> and benches for the house like it's hilarious but you know I continued to fall, evolve in her footsteps I eventually landed on a national team myself I was a Canadian uh, paranational guide runner so I uh, ran with a blind athlete on the paranational team and continued on my career in track and field, but I was also working as a personal trainer at the time. So I was working, you know, I'm sure most of us have started out in that field. And I think most of us have continued on with our passion out of our own personal rock bottom. So I was easily working 13 hours a day with my eyes closed. Um, and then I'd go to practice. You're working at about three hours a day. I was getting maybe five hours of sleep. I was 
barely eating enough. I just looked so depleted. And then I eventually ended up training myself into cancer. So I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. <clears throat> and as shocking as it was at the time, after all the death settled, I kind of looked at myself and said, yeah, that makes sense. I had beaten my body up. I was so overstressed, so under recovered. It just, it made a lot of sense. Um, so I can, I continued on with my passion to encourage communities to stop dieting, to change the way they look at health and fitness, to approach it from a place of love versus a place of shame and to encourage communities to listen to their bodies. So I reverted back from, I was extremely hardcore. I reverted back from that methodology and started coaching and teaching people about sleeping more and working out less and not jumping into these hardcore fad workout regime crazes where they're ignoring their bodies and just working out on that method. So, you know, you fast forward uh, six, seven years later, we're grow we've grown, we're across Canada. It's an incredibly successful program. My mom is diagnosed with leukemia. So that experience continued to show me, she would say to herself, you know, it was a lot of stress induced illnesses that led her to this place. Is it her fault? Absolutely not. But it's just continued affirmation and confirmation for the work that I do is if you are not listening to your body, you're working out all day long and you're eating all of the right foods, but you are not listening to your body's signals, it doesn't matter how many workouts you're doing, you could be doing your body even more harm. So that, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a backwards approach to the rest of the mainstream media with, with health and fitness, but I, I'll encourage people to sleep more than I will uh, to work out right off the hop, right? Especially right now, we're all over stress. So I come at it from a bit of a different approach, but definitely from, from many rock bottoms that continue to fuel the fire and some passion. Yeah, yeah. I have a feeling all four of us kind of come at this from a sort of backwards approach from mainstream, right? Um, Mitchell, what about you? Uh, any, any stories about how you got started or, or anything? Yeah, actually, my progression into what I do now actually came from as a child. Um, I was the 99 pound weakling guy, the guy who sat, had sand kicked in his face constantly. I mm -hmm. had severe anxiety walking to high school. It was a terrible, terrible situation. Horrible self-esteem, horrible. Um, and so at some point I did introspective thinking and said, you know what, you got to change yourself. You got to figure out why you're so unhappy, why you hate yourself so much. And so I recognized I was just really, really thin and I was going to try to change that. So I did what every guy does. You get some barbells and you watch Joe Weider books and movies and all that crap. And, you know, everyone's trying. But the fact was my metabolism just was very, very fast. And so all of a sudden, and this is where it gets a little bizarro. I decide to take a high school physics course and start applying the laws of physics to weightlifting, force vectors, fulcrum arms, uh, levers, kinetic energy, potential energy, and really analyzing what I'm doing. What's the right hand placement? Well, it's not arbitrary. It's actually based on if the force that you're pulling against, you have to pull 180 degrees to that force to actually pull the optimal force. Uh, so you can push the most amount of resistance, all these types of things. And so over a four year period, I put 40 pounds of muscle on. I go from 160 pounds to 200 pounds. And, um, you know, I'm not going to deny it was a good self-esteem thing and, and, and it made me feel better about myself. I'm not denying that. The weird thing was that I was a project manager in construction. That was my first career. And towards the end of this four year period, I decide I'm just not getting satisfied through that job. And I'm going to try to find a new career. And lo and behold, I find this thing called physical therapy. And, you know, it's only a couple of years of medical school versus the full thing going for a physician. And you still get to work on people's bodies. So I'm like, oh, this is great. Well, as I get into this initiation of this, I start coming to this realization that structural variations aren't causing pain. It's muscular. Oh, what a great thing to have had happen. I just taught myself the biomechanics and physics of weightlifting. What a perfect way to implement what I know into how I'm going to treat people. And it's almost feels like it's fate, like I've been used as a tool for a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the process that I, I've gone through. Now I've actually put on another 20 pounds. I put actually 60 pounds. I've gone from 160 pounds to 220 pounds of, of muscle. Um, and, and I kind of use myself as a 
um, representation of what I think can be accomplished. And I'm not saying I think everyone should put 60 pounds of muscle on, but if you have a muscular deficit, there's no reason to think that you can't resolve that deficit and sustain the strength you need to be pain-free and fully functional with the appropriate information. And I kind of want to just have one thing Mia said, which is so important for people who understand. People get into this mindset, weight lift, weight lift, weight lift, make muscle, make, I got all that. And that's not, it's not to say that's not important, but there's two sides to making muscle. There is the breaking down of muscle, creating micro tears, which leads to an inflammatory response, which is where muscle grows. That is the healing phase. And everyone had better understand that the healing phase is just as important as the breaking down phase. And if you think that you can go six days of working out with one day off, you can't be surprised that you're going to get burnt out. And mm -hmm. burnt out is really the psychological and emotional response to the physical breaking down of your muscle. Mm -hmm. So that is critical to understand. For a guy like me who lifts crazy squat, 425, straight leg deadlift, 405. I mean, I, I lift heavyweight. For me, I am so... Um, uh, so broken down from the workouts, it takes me two, three days to recover after any workout. For two right. to three days, there's no chance in hell I could lift the weight. Right. And I recognize that and I embrace that. Mm -hmm. And I do all the things, other things Mia mentioned about sleeping properly, proper nutrition, all the things to help me heal. Mm -hmm. That is just as important as the working out portion. So um, I'm right on when it comes to that aspect. There's the, uh, there's a, I think it was a meme going around a while ago. And this guy was, he's like, I'm going to go build some muscle. And, uh, and the other guy's like, well, he, what are you talking about? You're just walking to your bedroom. And he's like, yeah. And he, he was going, he was going to sleep. <laughs> right. Cause that's when the muscle is going to build itself. Right. right? Exactly. He's going to heal. Um, I wanted to shift, uh, you know, Nadia and Mia, you guys both mentioned that you, you deal more with like big groups, right? I wanted to shift more to like, big groups like the the country or the world right like do you guys think we are this is a very general question you can go whatever direction you want to go with it but do you think we are going in the right direction um and i'm sure it's mixed right some ways we are like i think the average person knows more about fitness than they did 50 years ago um in what ways are we going the right direction in what ways maybe should we change direction and go, you know, maybe go a different direction. And I'm going to leave it open. Whoever wants to chime in first, you guys can. I'll go. I'm a, uh, I love what Mitch is saying. I'm like, preach. <laughs> I feel like more <laughs> people need to hear this. It's like years and years and years. Like we do some work with our national wellness program here in, um, in Canada and Toronto. And it's the same messaging that they have had since I was a baby, the same conversations. Um, you know, and I think that it just sounds so backwards because of the mass, what mass media is telling you that we are so programmed to think that I'm a failure. I suck. I'm not working hard enough. I'm lazy if I'm not training more. And the concept of sleeping and recovery and taking care of yourself and fueling your body and working on your mental health is such a side conversation that people are starting to grasp it a little bit but they're going, yeah, but I still do need to work out. Like I definitely still need to do all of my workouts. And I think that we are, we're doing a lot that doesn't help us a lot because we are so overstressed. So many of us, especially right now, as everything has been moved virtual, there's so many people who are implementing lunchtime as another meeting time slot. So they're not getting any breaks throughout the day. They're not even able to properly digest their food because they're eating while they're on some sort of meeting. And they're just perpetually overstressed in their body over and over and over again, trying to maintain some sort of social life. So still staying up late in the weekends, just so they can have some sort of sense of normalcy and then still hitting their 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. workout class after getting five hours of sleep and thinking that, you know, I don't need that much or I can handle it, but not being enough, having enough bodily awareness to know that you're chronic bloating or even your runny nose or your chronic back pain is a cause of all of this effort and all the work that you're doing. So I hesitate to say that we could take one giant collective pause, have a really long nap, and then have enough mental clarity to adopt principles and practices 
that we're all talking about, that we preach on a daily basis, but we get rid of the mental clutter and the brainwashing, if you will, to be able to adopt something new and actually learn what it is like to feel good, because most of us don't even know what that's like, but learn what it's actually like to feel good and then continue moving in that direction. Again, from a place of love versus a place of shame. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm so excited about the person I'm becoming. I'm so proud of myself for doing what it is that I know my body needs versus, oh my God, I can't believe how much weight I've gained during the pandemic. I feel like crap. Look at this person. They're in such good shape. I'm the worst. I need to buy this workout program and train harder. Like that is the mentality that we have, whether it's exactly like that every day, overall, that's the way we think. So I think if we just did this giant left turn in the other direction, that we would see a lot more results than we would with what we're doing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, to just piggyback off of what Mia was saying, we're also so very overstimulated and too, like we're just getting away from the basics, right? Like when we're going to bed, our phone is right next to us, right? We're staying up later. Uh, we're not getting enough sleep, like, like Mia mentioned. And also too, when we're moving our bodies, just recognizing like our bodies were created to move. We're not moving for some aesthetic pleasure and also movement is stillness, right? Movement is resting. Movement is sitting with your thoughts. What am I thinking, right? Um, what, what do I need to release, you know, and all those things. So to answer your question, I think while maybe overall it may seem in mass media, like, oh, you know, this is healthier, this is that, but underneath it, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, right? People are going into grocery stores and thinking, hey, this is quote unquote healthy because there's some pretty label on it. But then when you flip it over, there's a, there's a million ingredients that you don't know how to pronounce that can be aiding into inflammation, that can be aiding into you not getting sleep and all these things, but you're just going off of what the front says. So I just really think that we need to strip it down and just get back to the basics, right? Like um, sit with our thoughts, um, sit with our emotions, move our bodies from a joyful place, get rest, turn the phone off, spend time with your family, like practice attitude of gratitude. You see what I'm saying? And just really um, sit in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could, I just want to talk about two things that just came up, which I think are critical for people to understand. So you, by the time you've got the kidney stone, the heart disease, the things that you're going to the doctor for, you have to understand disease has entered you and it happens to present, be presenting in a particular organ. If you want to take the appropriate mindset of how to keep yourself healthy, the key is to stop disease from entering you. And the way you do that is to sustain a very strong immune system. How do you sustain a strong immune system? Well, you exercise, you eat right, you sleep appropriately, and you reduce your stress. Everything everyone's talking about, it's the same thing. It's the four pillars of health. Everyone must start to recognize health comes from within yourself. There ain't no medical group that makes you healthy. Anyone who thinks that is insane. They're listening to the story that they're being told. By the time you've gotten to the cardiologist, you're in trouble. Yeah. You've now reached a point of trouble. Don't think that guy is magically going to make you be healthy because all they're going to do is address your high blood pressure, your high blood pressure, which came from plaque developing in an artery. Guess what they're going to do for you? They're going to give you Lasix, which decreases blood volume. They're going to give you a calcium channel blocker, which decreases calcium's ability to enter the heart, which decreases the cardiac output. And they're going to give you a beta blocker, the nerve that innervates it. So they're going to do everything they can to reduce your blood pressure. But what did they do to reduce the plaque that developed that's creating it? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. What can you do about it? Oh, that's right exercise, eat right, reduce your stress, and sleep right. Wow! Who's got the better control over your health? Trust me, it's you. Mm -hmm. That's my first point. The second point, everyone keeps talking about how they feel about themselves, how they feel about themselves. Well, guess right. There is a connection between the physical body, the mental body, the emotional body, and the spiritual body. And any one of those not functioning properly will affect the other. 
you you thought you were going to get a raise. You didn't get the raise. All of a sudden, you feel you dislike yourself. You're unhappy. You're undeserving and all that stuff. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to go. You're going to start eating crazy. You're going to sleep unlimited time. You're going to become real depressed, right? And that's now what? Going to set up for physical ailment. Mm -hmm. So you have a spiritual deficit creating physical. Oh, you have knee pain that's unresolved. You can't walk. You can't go flight up flights as fast. I mean, I treat a woman, women who can't hold their kid. How do you think that makes them feel where they can't love their child because they can't hold them because their knee or their back hurts too much? Well, that's going to physical thing is now going to affect them mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And that's going to affect that their entity as a whole. So. I and and I be, I found enlightenment three years ago, and my life has become transformed. I live with I don't have ego. I don't even know what ego means anymore. And trust me, I was the biggest ego maniac you could find. It was not a good. I was not a good person. <laughs> and and then I found this concept of enlightenment, living for the moment. Everything you're talking about, man. Every morning for an hour, I sit outside with a cup of coffee, listening to spa music, staring at trees just staring at trees and recognizing the genius of the freaking tree and how incredible that tree is and how small I am in relationship to the tree and the sky and the birds. And man, it just makes you realize there's so much more to life to appreciate than wondering, if I'm, am I going to make that extra buck today? I mean, it just, it just puts everything into context and you get to live, you learn to live for the moment. I have a 15 year old daughter. Every moment I'm with her, I embrace it so much more now. Everything, everything tastes better, looks better, feels better. Once you find that point of the sense of connecting mind, body, and spirit. And I, I mean, I, I think it's great if you can try to go and get help to get that, but until the person at I mean, I, I got this. I'm 61. I'm going to be 61 now. I got this at 58. Until you're ready, that person has to commit to it. Mm -hmm. They yeah. can go get help, but until they're willing to make, commit and say, yes, I am ready to make the change, it's going to be really hard for the person. So I think those are really important things for people to start looking at. And, and, and as everyone's agreeing, it's not the normal mindset that's being promoted out there. So No, I don't think so. I think it's really key too, to, um, you know, all of you actually touched on this. It's this belief in our own innate immune system. And, and Mitchell, you mentioned like, you know, once you go to the doctor, you're going for a certain symptom. You're, you know, you've forgotten that the trees are magical. You've forgotten how to meditate, how to yeah. sleep properly. You've forgotten all these things that I think a lot of us knew as children. Um, you know, when you're tired, you, you rest, right. And you eat your lunch, right. And like stuff like that. But then I'm seeing, especially now during the pandemic, so many people second guessing their own immune system, their own ability to be healthy themselves, right? And like you said, they're looking for who's gonna who's gonna help me, who's gonna save me, right? It's it's inside of all of us, and I think Absolutely. that's the magic of it. And once we can get in touch with it, it doesn't perform up to this level if we're chronically stressed, if we're eating Twinkies for breakfast, if we're sleeping three hours a night. Mm -hmm. But there are very simple things that we can do. And I think that's the inspiring thing is like at any moment, you know, you could have had a, a bad breakfast, but your lunch can be amazing. Your dinner can be amazing. You can go to sleep at a reasonable time and kind of make that turnaround, which I think is really inspiring. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it, wow. We have, I, this always happens because we all have so much to talk about, but I told you guys 30 minutes and we've kind of hit that mark. I want to give each of you a chance to, uh, talk about how people can get in contact with you, you know, website, social media, or any programs you have coming up that you want to talk about. So um, we'll let any of you start that. Um, <laughs> basically, get in touch with me. It's by email at drmitchmitchellyouse.com or go to my website, livewithoutpains.com. Uh, the important thing I try to make people recognize is I live in Jacksonville, Florida, but you don't have to live in Jacksonville, Florida to get my method. I've been doing virtual um, treatments and sessions well before there was even Zoom when it was just Skype and that was even at its inception. Uh, and that's the great part about it. The method can be gotten anywhere in the world. All you need is a resistance band in a chair. And I can, if you have a muscular cause of pain, it can be resolved. And um, 
all I suggest to everybody is, and it's kind of going back to what we keep talking about, that generalized concept of start thinking you have more control of your life. Don't be so willing to accept everything someone tells you just because they said it or they have a certain name tag. You know, start using your head. And if something doesn't make sense, say to yourself, maybe there's an alternative. Maybe there's something else I need to think about. And hopefully that's where I come in and we get you pain free, fully functional, and we get to live this incredible life that everyone's describing. So that's my message. I think we can all take a, a collective deep breath to everybody listening and saying, you have the tools. I think that's the main point that we're all trying to get across is you have the tools. You are more than capable if it, it is inside of you. The biggest thing that I have seen recently is this movement towards talking about mental health and any type of spiritual practice, any type of meditation. I love that that's a conversation and that's becoming trendy because even if you just started with that, I guarantee you, I wholeheartedly believe and promise you that that will change your life and change your health. If you just start there. So you don't have to, you know, feel like you need to know all of it right now. You can start with the simplest things like going for a walk, like getting some sleep, like starting to meditate. That is all that it takes. You can give yourself permission to start exactly where you're at and do what you have. So if you like this, you can uh, head over to movecamp.ca and sign up for some of our free events. Uh, we, everything we do is free. We've got coaches that we work with across Canada that you can interact with and you can link up with me um, at Mia St. Bay is my handle, but you can also find me on our website. One thing that I always share with my clients is, you know, you can, a determined mind with discipline and direction is, unstop, is unstoppable. So just making that choice, right? Commit right where you're at and just focus on one step, one thing. Um, how can I get one step better, right? If I'm sitting on the couch, can I walk around the block, right? Can I incorporate more water? So with that being said, um, right at the cashmethod.com, I offer a class on how to ditch the diet mindset for good. And then also you can find me on Instagram at not cash. And lastly, text me. You can just text cash with a K to 401-341-1402. Well, this has been a great episode. I appreciate all three of you joining me today, Mitchell, Nadia, and Mia. Thank you guys so much for joining me on Health in the Real World. And all of you listening, go check out their websites, their programs, and, uh, and keep the conversation going. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,